Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Atomy Brainwaves, our podcast on education for educators. Brainwaves is produced by our wonderful team here at Atomy. What is Atomy? It's an online teaching and learning platform for secondary education. We provide engaging, curriculum-specific video and text lessons for over 190 subjects, as well as matching quizzes and exam practice that can be used for both learning and formative assessment. We also provide powerful analytics that can help teachers diagnose how their students are progressing and zero in on who might need a little bit of extra help. Our goal is to help make life easier for our teachers, give them more time to work on the most important things, and ultimately help to generate better outcomes. If you want to find out more about Atomy, head over to our main site at getatomy.com and feel free to try it out for free. This week I spoke with Catherine Burblesing, CBE award-winning British educator and founder of the famous Michaela Community School. We discussed Catherine's journey in the face of adversity to create Michaela before a deep dive into the school itself, its traditionalist values and structures that have made it so divisive to public opinion, and a breakdown of both the school's successes and the criticisms against it. If that sounds good to you, make sure to subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you do your podcast listening, and we'll never say no to a quick five-star review. For now... Have a listen and enjoy. Are you going to teach us anything? What, you want me to teach you something? You want to learn something? All right. You got it! Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Atomy Brainwaves. I'm your host, Simon, and today I'm joined by a very special guest, Catherine Burblesing, CBE multi-award winning British educational reformer, author and founder and headmistress of Michaela Community School. Welcome, Catherine. Hi there. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Quite a quite the CV there. Um, lots of yeah. very exciting stuff for us to get into on this kind of wet and miserable uh, Monday afternoon, which, yeah. which it is here in Dublin, I think. I can see in the background a little bit. Uh, that it looks like to be a similarly poorly day over there. Yes, it is. <laughs> Indeed. But we'll brighten it up with some stimulating educational conversation. So yes. when we, oftentimes when we have guests on, uh, our central topic uh, tends to be around some sort of, you know, educational philosophy in which they're an expert or something, but we're kind of breaking new ground here because... The central topic that uh, we're going to be talking about today is the school, which, as uh, listeners heard in the intro there, you founded and are headmistress of Michaela Community School, which, despite being a relatively young school, has become, I think it's safe to say, one of the most talked about, one of the most interesting schools in Britain in recent years. So very excited to get into that. But before we do... Uh, we're going to ask you, as we always do with guests, to give us just a bit of a brief run through of your journey in education, you know, where you started out in terms of teaching and I guess the different twists and turns that, that led you up to uh, where you are now, which is, of course, at Michaela. Yeah, well, um, I became a teacher uh, when I left uh, university. Um, I wanted to change the world and I wanted to work in the inner city with disadvantaged kids. So I've always worked in inner London. Um, I did so for many years in a couple of few different schools um, and found that some of the assumptions I had made before about what was wrong with the education system were perhaps incorrect. Um, And I just found that out through experience. I also found that the stuff that I had been taught how to do on my teacher training PGCE were not things that actually worked. I would find that the stuff that uh, senior teams would, uh, senior leadership teams would give, do inset days, training days, where they would tell us how to do X, Y, and Z in the classroom. And I'd try it out and think, but this is nowhere near as good as the more traditional way. And so it was over many years that um, I came to understand what I understand now, which is that a more traditional education is the better education. Um, I used to write a blog uh, which was called To Miss With Love um, for a few years. This is perhaps in 2006, 2007, around then, um, when blogs didn't really exist. They were quite rare. 
nowadays everybody has an education blog whereas in those days it was it was it was very rare there was one other that i knew of and um uh i used to write stories about the kinds of things that would happen to the kids at school so they'd get their lunch money stolen or they'd be bullied or they wouldn't be able to go to the loo for fear of what would happen to them or they would be beaten up or you know remember this is the inner city so those kinds of things were typical uh, really um or I'd write stories about how little children knew, uh, poor behavior in classrooms, that sort of thing. And, uh, and I built up quite a following. In those days, there was no Twitter. There was no, uh, there was no way of discussing what was on blogs apart from on the blog itself. So people would come on and comment in the comment section. And uh, it was there that I started really thinking properly about these ideas, things that I thought were just obvious truths like, um, why was it that uh, kids were misbehaving in lessons? Well, I thought it was because uh, the discipline structures in the schools weren't tight enough. Uh, but then I found a lot of people would come on and argue with me and say, no, it was because schools didn't have enough money, for instance. And I used to think, no, it's not because of a lack of money. It's because of a number of bad ideas. Um, and so I would get into discussions with people and sometimes some arguments with people. And then eventually in 2010, I gave a speech at the Conservative Party conference where I said that the system was broken. Uh, I famously said, because it keeps poor children poor. Um, and because I gave this speech that, uh, where I made a number of attacks on various uh, kind of ideas in the education system that um, are, are, are not allowed to be criticized, um, I was then... Uh, well, in a lot of hot water and I was all over the news and so on. And um, in the end, I had to resign from my school. And uh, I was then told by various people that I would never work in the state sector again. Um, and so I had to come up with an alternative idea, at which point I decided to uh, set up a free school because in 2010, uh, this idea had come about as a possibility uh, where a group of people could set up a school and uh, apply through the Department for Education. You had to go through a rigorous interview process and so on. Um, but, you know, it was possible to open a school. Because I was at the beginning of this um, new era, uh, there was a lot of pushback. Um, and it took us three years to find a building because we had so many detractors trying to stop us from opening. We would have people protesting outside our parents' evenings, people infiltrating our parents' evenings where they would stand up and shout at me and call me names. They had pickets with insults directed towards me. We had to hire a bouncer once um, just because I was so worried about the possible violence that might take place. So it was quite a fight to get the place open, but eventually in 2014, in September, we opened with 120 year sevens. Now, we are seven years later and we have a full school, but we only have had a full school since September. So this is our first year as a full school. And so we have children now who are with us, who've been with us for seven years since year seven, who are now applying to university uh, and will leave us at the end of the year. And we are able to say we saw them through their secondary school education. There are some, of course, who left us after five years after their GCSEs, which took place five years in when they were in year 11. And some of those went off to various different colleges to do other things. So um, we have since, of course, had our Ofsted, which in this country is the inspectorate that goes around and tells schools whether they're good or bad. And we were rated very highly by Ofsted, so that was nice. Although I have to say I'm not a particular fan of Ofsted. And, um, and then, uh, of course, in our first year of GCSE results, we also did very well uh, coming fifth in the country um, for our progress eight score is what they call it, which demonstrates the progress that children have achieved from uh, the beginning of uh, in year seven, right through to year 11. Um, so yeah, and now we're here. Um, you know, obviously there's the pandemic and things are a bit different. Uh, and last year, obviously there were uh, teacher assessment results. Um, so, which, which is a bit odd because that should have been our second year, but hopefully this year, I'm hoping that exams in some form will remain uh, so that we can build on our success. Because it's a bit odd when you're having to make the assessments yourself. You really want to kind of go up against those exams. <laughs> and um, we weren't able to do that in our second year. 
Wow, it's a really a really fascinating journey, a really interesting one with so many twists and turns along the way. And one thing that's coming through, I guess a recurring theme, I think it would be fair to say, is that adversity has very much, it seemed, been a part of of your journey, of course, but also the journey of of Michaela. Obviously, the two are so intertwined. And we'll touch a little more on that later on. But just coming from that, uh, you know, you talked about how there were people giving you pushback going back to blogging days through that that famous speech that you gave and all the way through the foundation of the school. I was just wondering, to what extent was that pushback coming from within the educational community, other teachers who would have gone through similar experiences as, as you in terms of coming up through the teaching ranks versus coming from parents or the general public who might not have had such an insider's perspective or, or, or was it a case that there was pushback from from both and neither particularly more so than the other? Um, well, it, it tended to be a political divide. So because okay. I spoke at the Conservative Party conference, uh, you know, conservative people tended to be supportive of me. Uh, people on the left were not. Um, it really is sort of unacceptable for uh, an inner city school teacher to go and speak at the Conservative Party conference and criticize the education system. Um, now, it was interesting because I had a website and I got hundreds of emails from teachers across the country who all said to me, thank you so much for saying something. Somebody needed to speak out. Thank you for doing it. But they wouldn't tell me their names. And that was because they were terrified. And I know why they were terrified, because they would have been vilified the way I was, because it is simply blasphemous to criticize the education system. The only thing I would say is more untouchable than the education system is the NHS. You simply cannot criticize the NHS, whoever you are. So um, I was lambasted for criticizing the education system, but also for siding with the right, as it were. Um, so I find not all, all people on the left. I am on Twitter and I have followers who are very much on the left and they love what I do and they support me. But uh, people who are more on the extreme left are very anti what we do. They're anti our values because I would say that we have small C conservative values at the school and that the things that I believe in are small C conservative. And so people on the extreme left, see people who are not so extreme on the left, I'd say they themselves also have small C conservative values because values are not um, are not political necessarily. They're just a kind of way of life. Um, you might say that people in the East uh, have small C conservative values. The idea of being stoical, when something knocks you down, you pick yourself up and you keep on going. Or the idea of having a duty to your family or to your community, um, to your school. Um, or the idea of personal responsibility, that you own your mistakes and you own your life. And that you, you know, you're, when you're in control of your life, you, 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 you have a goal and you go for it. And you make sure you have those blinkers on. You don't get distracted. And when you make mistakes, you apologize for them. You learn from them and you keep on going. Now, all of those ideas that I'm saying there are, are small C conservative ideas, which I would say... Oh, I don't know. Lots of people in China have that, you know. Um, and uh, when I say, you know, there's a there's a real Eastern philosophy. I think uh, people involved in martial arts would would recognize very much what I'm talking about there. But um, yeah, there is, I think, a real rejection of those types of values uh, nowadays in education. Uh, well, I say nowadays in the last twenty, thirty years. Um, and it's getting worse and worse. And that is not helpful for children because children need those uh, powerful ideas uh, to prop them up and to build them into the kinds of adults that will be successful and resilient and, deter resilient and determined and ambitious. Uh, to become all those things, you need these other values on which to stand. And um, sadly, I find those values are disappearing. Okay, yeah, it's it's a really interesting perspective, and I suppose it, in many ways, what you're talking about rings true, of course, in education. But really, we're sort of seeing in so many walks of life uh, the degree to which polarization, political polarization, bleeds into different conversations and almost sort of sort of takes over and creates those adverse conditions. And one other thing, just on this idea of adversity, before we we move on, that that occurs to me is. 
you know, of course, from your perspective, you can, I, I feel like I'm, I'm almost answering the question in advance for you here, because you can say, given that the success that you've overseen in Michaela over the past number of years vindicates the approach you've taken. But, you know, you talked about how comments you made in that, in that speech were, were divisive. And I, I suppose you probably had an idea that they were going to be divisive before you made them. To what extent do you think that taking the stance that you have and adopting a position where you are going to speak out and you're not going to mince your words, to what extent do you think that's been important in the success that you've gone on to have? And, and I suppose the, the path that you've chosen to take, taking that stand, is that being a, a really important thing in the foundation of Michaela setting, setting out your stall where you did and saying, I'm not going to mince my words or mollycoddle to any, any view that I don't agree with that I don't think is the right way to go about this educational project? No, um, I could have, if I'd set up a school and never given that speech, um, I would still have done the same things. <laughs> okay. So it, it's not really about announcing it, uh, but I do seek truth. So it's not about wanting to be divisive. It's about seeking truth. It's about wanting to do what works. It's about not following an ideology. Um, I think too many people in education are hampered by their ideology. So they don't try out different ideas. They don't uh, question the status quo. They just accept, well, poor kids do badly and that's how it is. And so they keep doing the same old thing. Whereas my point is, well, let's try and do something differently. So okay. we have tried out so many different ideas here at Michaela and we have um, changed, I mean, more times in one week than most schools will change in a whole year. <laughs> um, we're constantly changing our timetable, constantly changing our systems of all sorts. And the reason why we do that is because we're trying to find what's optimal, what's best, what works. And um, I don't find that happens as much as it should in education. Of course it does in, in pockets, but generally speaking, people are too comfortable with the status quo. And so, yes, I'm relatively radical. I like to shake things up. I like to question. Um, and that isn't about being divisive. That's just about finding out what works. I mean, we're meant to be in this game uh, to try and um, do what's best for the kids. Um, and doing the same thing over and over again, which is clearly failing the children. I mean, in, 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 in England, 20% of children uh, leave school functionally illiterate and functionally innumerate. I mean, that's a lot of kids, you know? Um, and um, there's something wrong. Uh, and the thing is, is that there are lots of teachers who know this to be the case. I hear from them all the time. They just don't dare say it out loud. Uh, I hear from them on Twitter. I've heard from them by email. I go to conferences and people run up to me and they say, I really like what you say on Twitter. And then they run away. <laughs> um, and they don't dare tell me who they are. Uh, I know that what I'm saying is right because there are so many people who support me on it. Um, but I feel it's like the emperor's new clothes. Nobody will come out and say it. So in a way, I mean, your point is, yes, there was the making of Michaela, which required those ideas. But then there's a separate thing that's happened, which is that I've said it out loud. <laughs> mm. And um, if I'd done this quietly, I suspect nobody would have a problem with it. It's the fact that I keep on talking about it that people don't like. <laughs> hey, folks. Hope you're enjoying the episode so far. And we've got plenty more to come after this quick break. Here at Atomy Brainwaves, we're all about education. And not just for students, for ourselves, too. We would love to hear from you whether that's feedback on one of our episodes or a question you'd like to see answered by one of our guests or by Sue. So if you've got a comment or a question, don't hesitate to email us at brainwaves at getatomy.com. Looking forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, let's get back to it. Yeah, well, of course, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and, and I suppose brings us around from this sort of background and everything that led up to it right into... Michaela itself and we're going to get into the day-to-day -day, uh, soon and of course you've talked about there about how adaptability is, is such a key tenet of the school but I just wanted to before we got into that even more just to 
you've already given us a bit of this, but get even more of a sense of, I suppose, the school's values, the the motivations and the reasoning behind, I suppose, its traditional style of teaching. What what would those values be? You've yep. already described it a little bit for us, but if you could give us even yes. a little more. Sure. Well, when it comes to the teaching, so the way things have developed over the last 50, 60 years um, is that people think, I think wrongly, that the best way of teaching children is to have the children lead the learning, that the children will be able to lead their own learning and get on with things and teach themselves. And I suppose the motivation behind this is that people remember some old boring teacher they had at school who stood at the front of the class just droning on and that they were bored. And so because they were bored, they think, oh, I know what we do to break it up. Let's put the kids in groups and then they'll get involved. It'll be more hands-on. It'll be more, more interactive. And so the thinking comes from a good place. Um, and they are good people. They're just wrong in terms of their pedagogy. It just doesn't work. You tend to put children together and they talk about the kid, the boys or girls they fancy, you know, what they're doing in the evening, what television programs they like or whatever's happening on Instagram. You know, they, they don't really talk about the work. Um, and even if you get kids who talk about the work, they're just not going to do it with the same expertise as the teacher can. So if the teacher is at the front of the classroom teaching the children whose desks should be in rows facing the teacher, then the children are going to make a lot more progress a lot faster. So that's what we found at Michaela. Because we've changed our minds on this, we teach the children, all of the classrooms have desks in rows, all of the classrooms have teachers that stand at the front and teach the kids. And so the children are being led by the teacher. And all of our guests, we get 600 visitors every year. Um, and they're from all over the world, and they're mainly teachers. And every single one of them, without exception, cannot believe the progress that our children are making. They just look at them and they say, it's amazing. How have you managed to do this? And I always say, because the teachers are teaching them. <laughs> you know, they are leading them. And that nowadays in 2020 is quite a revolutionary idea. Um, so what I would say to any of your listeners who are teachers is, as much as it, it seems like it's wrong, and that you feel like somehow you're um, letting children down by actually teaching them at the front of the classroom, uh, don't worry about it. That's the right thing to do. Now, that doesn't mean that you drone on and on and on. You teach them for a while. You do a class discussion. You might do a bit of paired work quickly. Turn to your partners quickly. Tell me, blah, blah, blah. And then they go, da, 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 30 seconds, three, two, one, hands up. And then you say, okay, everyone now, exercise two, let's go to it. And then they do that for five six, seven minutes, and then you bring them back and you have another class discussion or you teach them some more. The key thing is that the teacher knows where the class is going and is leading that class um, because the teacher is in charge. And I would say that this is all based in the un understanding that the adult is the authority. The adult is the person who's got the authority to make the right decisions, to teach the right stuff. And um, I think sadly, in the last 30 years or so, we've thrown that idea out and we feel uncomfortable about allowing the teacher to be the authority because we feel that somehow being the authority means you're author authoritarian. And the problem with that is that uh, that means everybody is the same and the children are teaching the teacher and the teacher is teaching the children. And that all sounds very egalitarian, but it doesn't really work because the children don't know more than the teacher. The teacher knows more. <laughs> and the teacher ought to lead that learning. And that doesn't mean that they're authoritarian. It doesn't mean that they're Hitler. It doesn't mean that they're going to abuse that power. And I think because we're worried that the teacher will abuse that power, we, we try and restrict the power of the teacher. And um, the thing is the teacher is somebody who loves the children, <laughs> who wants what's best for the children. So um, I think we need to t trust our teachers more to be able to lead those children, there is some exception where there is a teacher who doesn't do a good job. Fine, then you hold them to account. But we don't change the entire system to make it so that children don't learn as much in the classroom as they otherwise could. So that's what I'd say is the big difference for us in terms of teaching. There's also behavior. We do behavior very differently. We have centralized the tensions. We have very high expectations of behavior. We give out demerits and detentions for little things like turning around in class. We have what are called silent corridors. Now, 
look, we say good morning and good afternoon to each other in the corridors, but that's it. Children don't chat to each other as they go to their lessons. Now, it's possible that in Dublin, there'll, some of your listeners will think, well, that's a bit extreme. And I understand that when your intake doesn't require that. So I went to see a selective girls' school the other day up here in North London. And those girls did not need silent corridors at all. It's a selective environment that it's not required. But I can tell you that in the inner city, it's absolutely required. Because if you don't have silent corridors, the kids are punching each other. They're bashing each other's heads into the wall. It's a really scary place to be. Also, we've got children turning up with a reading age of a six-year-old or a seven-year-old when they are, in fact, 11 years old. It takes a lot of time to try and catch those kids up. So I want them moving very quickly in the corridors to the next lesson so that we can maximize their lesson time. If you let them wander around, some kids turn up 10 minutes late, 15 minutes late to the lesson. They throw the door open, bam, the whole class is disrupted. The teacher is standing at the front, silence, I need silence, please. I mean, now, and that goes on for another five or 10 minutes. Now, some of the teachers listening, if they're in some nice village school somewhere, might think, what on earth is she talking about? That may very well be the case in your nice village school that you don't know what I'm talking about. That's great. But I can tell you that in inner city London, that sort of thing is standard. <laughs> so it really is about head teachers and senior teams choosing the right kinds of methods that will work in their school. Um, I do think that many schools, wherever they are, could tighten up on things though and maximize the use of their lesson time, maximize behavior and really increase, you know, raise their standards and have teachers teaching from the front and leading the learning. Yeah, it's a really, you know, it, 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 what really comes across, uh, sorry, first of all, a very articulate explanation, what really comes across as well as the, I suppose, the passion you have for this and the belief you hold in these values, in these kind of underlying uh, beliefs uh, within Michaela. And I suppose what's really coming across in what you're saying for me, and I'm going to ask you, it would be fair to say this is the pivotal importance as you perceive it of discipline to to the workings of the yeah. school to the working of the classroom and, and would it be fair to say that you would believe that I guess discipline sort of has to be or at least in the sort of environment in which you're talking about uh, which of, of Michaela discipline really has to be the the cornerstone upon which everything else is built yeah yes absolutely so if you don't have discipline you can't do anything else uh, the first thing you need to do when going into a school that's in chaos is sort out the discipline. Um, and then one way you do that is by centralizing it all. Now, some head teachers are reluctant, and I sort of understand why. Um, we have centralized, and what I mean by that is when a teacher sends a child to detention, that teacher isn't manning her own detentions. She's sending him to a centralized detention system where the child has to turn up on a rotated system where teachers run one room and there's the detentions that happen in there. Um, we find that works quite well. It also means that it's not left up to the individual teacher because when you do that, um, if teacher X always sets detention and always follows them through, then all the kids behave in her class. But if in teacher Y's class, she never sets detentions, then behavior can go awry over there. And really what you want is consistent behavior throughout your school. So you want to create behavior systems that are consistent throughout every classroom. And that's why then you want to have silent or orderly classrooms, as, uh, corridors, I should say, as best you can, because corridors are the place where no teacher owns. They don't own the corridor. And they're not necessarily in the corridors when the children are moving. And so that's when all sorts of issues can happen. And then nobody really knows whose responsibility it is to chase up those issues. And better, really, to create an environment where the issues never happen in the first place. So you don't have the fight that breaks out. You don't have the insults that happen. You don't have the children on their phones texting, creating some bullying situation. You know, you just keep the children, um, well, in a safe environment. What our children will always say to you is that they feel really safe here. They're safe just generally in going to the loo and in the corridors and they don't feel like they're, they're, that they are in danger, which frankly, in lots of schools, that really is the case. Um, but they're also safe in the classroom where they can put their hands up and ask any question they like. 
Um, they can answer questions without the fear of feeling like there's some kind of nerd or the teacher's pet. So look, I mean, I'm certainly not saying we're the only school that has this sort of culture. There will be other schools like us. Um, I, what I would say is that with a very difficult uh, inner city intake, uh, we have managed to do this through having what some people might call more extreme measures. Um, and, you know, you say about my passion. I mean, ultimately, why do I come into school every day? Because I love children. <laughs> why do I do what I do? Why, why do I, why have I torn up the rule book and tried again, you know, and, and, and keep trying? Because I'm seeking out truth. And because I love kids and I want to do what's right for kids. Why do we open our doors to 600 visitors every year? We don't benefit from it. We do that because we want to show people what's possible. So many people have written to us and said, thank you so much for the ideas that we've taken. We've implemented them at our school and the school is so much better as a result. So it makes me really happy when I know that not only do our children benefit from what we do here, but children at other schools across the across the world you know i've had people write from australia people have taken ideas back to chicago i mean all over the place and um and that's really exciting so you know i suppose what i'd say to your listeners is you might think oh gosh you know she spoke at the conservative party conference oh that makes her a bit a, a bit dodgy i would say look forget about the politics who cares you know think about the ideas Think about whether or not, do you want your children to take personal responsibility when they don't bring in the piece of homework? Is it their fault or is it somebody else's fault? Because if you say it's somebody else's fault and somebody else's responsibility, that means next time the child will not bring in the homework. And when you make the excuses of, well, he's poor or he lives in a council estate or his, his, his dad isn't around or whatever the reason is, the thing that you do is that you lower your standards for that child. And while you're doing it because you're trying to be nice, actually, you're not being nice. You're not helping that child. Because what then happens is that that child thinks that it's okay not to bring in his homework. And he never learns how to reach high standards. And then when he leaves school, functionally illiterate, functionally enumerate, or even if it's not that bad, he just doesn't fulfill his potential at, uh, at his exams at GCSE or whatever it is, then the thing is, is that for the rest of his life, He's carrying around less than he should have had. You're not helping the child by what would seem to be compassion in that moment. Um, you help that child by keeping your standards high for him, even though in the moment it's hard. Um, and that's what I would encourage all your teacher listeners to do, to keep your standards high. Because the child might push back in that moment, and when you hand him a detention, he gets angry with you but you can always repair the relationship afterwards. You can always have a chat with him and support him and maybe sort out a timetable for him at home so he knows when and how to do his homework. Ring home and talk to the mom and say, well, how do we support him? Can you sit at him at the dining room table? Can you turn the screen so that you're fa so it's facing you so you know that he's not on Snapchat instead? You, know, you, you try your best to support that child and to scaffold that child. Because ultimately you're doing this because you love him. You're not throwing him into detention because you dislike him. You're putting him in detention because you hope that that will be a corrective measure to help him do better next time. And then eventually, as he grows up, you instill a habit in him of meeting certain standards. So eventually he becomes the kind of child who always brings a pen into school, who always turns up on time, who always brings in his homework. And then that means later on in life, when he's going for his first interview and he's in his first job, it's not unusual for him to turn up on time and bring the right equipment and to do what he's told to do by his boss. And then he hangs on to his job. If we don't teach them those skills when they're at school, then they will be lost later in life. So that's what I would appeal to with your teachers is just to, while it might feel harsh in the moment, do what you know is right for that child and make sure that later he'll lead a successful adult life. Yeah, it's, it's one thing that comes up for me just listening to you talk about that and, and we'll guess, as I, I hope it's okay, we'll, we'll address maybe some of the criticism in, in, in a little bit that maybe you have received uh, in, in, in response to some of these techniques. But what, of course, I think it goes without saying that anyone listening would say that no matter what your approach, no matter what school of thought that if you're a teacher, if you're an educator, you are coming from what you've described as this place of love and this place of, you know, real desire and drive to 
to do the right thing for the kids, for the students, it just occurs to me to what extent in this process that you're talking about where, you know, detentions and these, these very clearly laid out rules with regards to codes of behavior, to what extent are the children in the school party to the conversation about this? Now, what I mean about that is, for instance, if a teacher is handing out one of these detentions to a student, is it communicated at that point, I'm doing this because I believe it's going to instill these habits in you? Okay, so there would be that... But, but wait, hang on. So maybe not at that moment. Maybe, that, what yes. they would say maybe is, not exactly is, phrased that way. Or turning around. Or they'll always, de- they'll always narrate why they've got the demerit. Demerit for, you know, whatever it was, you know. Demerit for talking. Right. Okay. Don't, let me, don't, don't put me in a position where I need to give you another demerit because that'll mean it's attention. So that is being narrated. But constantly through the school, through assemblies, through their, we call them sermons that the heads of year give them, um, on a daily basis, uh, three times a day. So the heads of year talk to them at the beginning of the day, at break time, and at lunchtime. And in each of those sermons, including their assembly that they will have twice a week, one assembly from me and one assembly from their head of year, and also the kind of thing that their tutor will say to them all the time in tutor time is why we have the school that we have. So the stuff that I've just said to you, all of our children could... I would say, say about 60 or 70% of what I've just said. <laughs> they really know it. They, they get it. They would tell you something along the lines of, well, when I first came, it was really hard and I had to get used to it. But now it's, it's second nature to me and I don't really think about it. And it means I'm safe and I'm happy and I really love coming to school. You know, that, that's some, they would say something along those lines. Um, they love it. The, the thing is, what everybody needs to remember is there's a lot more of them than there is of us. So you've got to have the majority buy-in, right? Mm. Your detentions only keep your 10, 15% in line. The majority of kids have to, keep, have to buy into this. Otherwise, you, would, you wouldn't have, the system wouldn't work. So the kids are definitely for this. I mean, if anything, whenever we ask them what we ought to do, um, you know, in some situation, they're always a lot more harsh than we are, always. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there really is, the children are really happy here. The children love our systems. We even have children getting up at lunchtime to give an appreciation because we do these appreciations where they thank people. They'll even thank their teachers for giving the demerit. They'll say, thanks so much to Mr. Smith for giving me a demerit because next time now I'm going to do my homework. That's what they say. I mean, <laughs> they really get it. And the reason why they narrate it in that way is because we have narrated it so many times why it is our system is the way that it is. And so they've understood it, you know? Yeah, of course. And, and, and look, as, as has been touched on earlier, you know, the, the success of, uh, of the school and, and all that it's achieved kind of, of course, I suppose, is, is proof right there that, that can be referenced to with regards to the buy-in from the kids and, and the outcomes that come from that. One, I suppose, one thing that, that does need to be raised, you know, in terms of what you're talking about with what some people might refer to as strictness in the school. I don't know whether or not that's a term that, that you like, I suppose the discipline, the, uh, the disciplinary approach uh, for want of a better term that's taken. And you've talked about the, the benefits therein to students for their behavior, for the focus in class and being brought together in this journey. I suppose on the opposite side of the debate, you might have someone who would say something along the lines of, you know, so much talk around education today talks about the value of not just knowledge, not just children gaining knowledge for exams, but also the development of skills, the development of creative and critical thinking, which beyond exams, beyond school, beyond even university and workplaces where that kind of versatility and ability to think on your feet, et cetera, the importance of that in a variety of workplaces and how it fostering that at school level is of increasing importance. And someone in that position might say something like, well, if you do have a classroom like in Michaela, where it is very much a a culture of complete deference to the teacher in the classroom and of silence in the corridors, et cetera, whether there might be the critical and creative thinking side of things for the students, is that being fostered to the extent where it, can be brought to bear in later life what would you say in response to to someone of that position 
Yeah, well, first of all, um, it would be a mistake to think that we're not interested in skills. Um, we are. It's just that the way to get there is through teaching them lots of stuff. <laughs> so uh, it would be a mistake, for instance, to think that exams, uh, at least the GCSE exams here, um, uh, aren't about being able to think and aren't about uh, critical thinking. So, you know, I'm just looking here at a history, a typical history question on a history GCSE would be, the Great Depression was the most important reason for Hitler's rise in power to power in 1933. How far do you agree? Well, you've got to be able to think through that. You can't just write down some memorized facts. I mean, they're, they're essays that you're writing in these exams. Um, you know, explain Macbeth's downfall. You know, well, okay, you've got to be able to think through that. So, um, uh, and the only way you can do that is through having lots of knowledge about it. So, um, I always give myself an, as an example. If you asked me to be really radical in my thinking and think independently about um, uh, astronomy, for instance, I couldn't tell you anything about astronomy. I don't know anything about it. So I couldn't think radically about it. Or do I, for that it. matter, if I'm being honest? All right. So, and if I asked you, tell me, tell me something, you know, turn it on its head, really make it, see it from a different point of view. You wouldn't know where to start. Well, it's the yeah. same thing when you say to a bunch of kids, I want you to turn Macbeth on its head and see it differently. And they think, well, I don't know anything about Macbeth, right? Now, it, I have been radical with education. I think independently about it. I am uh, very highly th critical in my thinking of it. Um, I do exactly what uh, people who say they're interested in skills want. I do that with education because I know it inside out. I can't do that with things that I don't know much about. If you tell me, oh, I don't know, the London transport system, be radical about it, Catherine. Change it up so that it's more efficient. I can't do that for you. I have no idea because I don't know anything about it. So the fact is that in order to be critical in your thinking and to be independently minded about something, you have to know lots about it. <laughs> that is how you reach the skill of being critical in your thinking about it. The, the mistake we make is in thinking uh, that children are already experts. That's the, pro that's the mistake. So we think to ourselves, what we need to do is put them in groups and then they'll be able to hash it out and figure out, uh, you know, Hitler's rise to power in 1933. They'll just, the, the information's already inside their heads and they'll draw it out and they'll have these interesting discussions. But they can't have an interesting discussion about Hitler's rise to power because they don't know anything about his rise to power. The teacher, however, has a whole degree in history, so they can teach this stuff to the kids. And once the kids have that information, then they can twist it around, they can analyze it, and they can do all sorts of things. But you've got to teach them this stuff in the first place. And then you can do a little bit of paired work, you can do a class discussion, and then you can do an essay, and you can do all the stuff that you want with that knowledge once that knowledge has been you know, given to the kid in the first place. So, and, and the the problem is, is that often the, the knowledge isn't given. And, and some teachers might say, oh, that's ridiculous. Of course, we always give them knowledge. No, I think just go into any classroom and you will find teachers playing what I call, guess what's in my head. They say things like, okay, can anybody tell me a reason for Hitler's rise to power in 1933? And the kids look at you and then somebody puts their hand up and they say something and you go, Oh, yes, nearly, nearly. Anybody else? Anybody else? And then somebody else, had, yes, oh, nearly, nearly. Now, it's clear that nobody has a clue. Why are we wasting our time? Why don't you just tell the kids, right? Now, you can tell the kids lots of stuff, then you can get them to do some pair work, and then you can all learn it together. Somehow, in 2020, it's become blasphemous for a teacher to actually teach, <laughs> right? So, that is how you're going to get your kids to think critically. They need the knowledge first, and then they can create their own ideas. When they're writing those essays, our kids aren't all writing the same essay. They've all got the information, and then they've come up with their own ideas. And then when they say, how far do you agree with that statement? Well, some of them will agree a lot. Some of them won't agree much. If you come to our school and talk to our kids, you will find so, kids who are so much more independently minded than kids anywhere. That's what all of our guests say. They can't believe it. And that's because they're really informed. <laughs> so 
it's important that you have the knowledge first before you uh, try and think uh, in an independent way about it. Um, but we're all for that. And children are not experts. That's what's key. If you put me and other educationalists who have been teaching a long time in a room and say, come up with some new ideas. Sure, we'll come up with some new ideas about education because we are experts. But that only works once the people involved in the discussion are experts. Yeah, no, it's certainly when it, when it comes to this idea, I suppose, of knowledge versus, not even knowledge versus skills, knowledge then skills, uh, it, certainly, it certainly makes a lot of sense. One just quick follow on with regards to that, uh, just to pause it again and just to, because I'm you know, really fascinated to hear your thoughts in response to this. One criticism that someone might make would be to something along the lines of in, a, in an environment where discipline is so paramount, you might have that one student who perhaps is a little bit afraid to speak out, is a little bit afraid to flex their creative muscle, if you will, and, and, and share an opinion they're not 100% sure about if it is an environment where so many walks of life within the school are very black and white, you know, you do this and you get a detention. This is how we do it. This is how we don't do it. Do you find that to be something that's borne out at all? And if so, what's the response within the school to overcome that? Or would you say that's not the case? In actual fact, the environment is one that gives life to students. They, they have that license to be creative just within a more structured, disciplined environment. Well, of course, it depends on what the demerits are being given for. So if we were, given de if we were giving de demerits for ha having creative th thoughts, then obviously the children wouldn't do it. But in fact, they're given merits for having creative thoughts. So if anything, our children are much more creative and far more likely to put their hands up. One of the things that guests always comment on is how many hands are up in class. And that's because they're really excited to say what they think, um, because that's celebrated here. Whereas elsewhere, if the teacher doesn't have control of the class, then the child is intimidated by their peers who look at them and think, you're just the teacher's pet, so they don't put their hands up. So I think it's quite the opposite. Our children are thrilled to try and answer and, and m make a stab of it. They just go for it, because mistakes are fine here. And if they get it wrong or it's not quite right, doesn't matter. They try again next time. I mean, that's, that's the culture that we have created here. Yeah. No, it's certainly, it's, it's, it's a compelling, uh, it's a compelling argument, a compelling defense of... Well, and what I'd say, I mean, you're obviously in Dublin, but what I would say is that people just need to come and see it because it's very hard for me to try and defend, um, by talking about it because people just think she's a bit kooky, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but I promise you, if you come and see it, you'll go, Oh, I see. It really is just like, how she said, <laughs> No, I know, and it, 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 it's totally true. And may I say, I think you have uh, made a very articulate explanation and, and defense of your position. But of course, and, it's, and it goes without saying that regardless of what your starting position is, you know, I, I certainly myself do believe that you should be at the very least open to seeing how something else works before, I suppose, coming to a final conclusion on it. Um, I, I feel as if, you know, you could... You could talk to us for days about the, the nuts and bolts and day-to-day -day workings of the school. Um, unfortunately, we don't have too much time left to do that. But one last thing with regards to Michaela that I wanted to ask you was, I guess, mm -hmm. a look into the future. Because what really stands out over, you know, the, the school is, I think, maybe seven years old, did you say? Or perhaps yes, a little older. Right. Seven years old and has undergone such growth in that time, such change in that time from in the face of adversity starting off and throughout to come to the position it's in now. So one thing that I think is really fascinating is to hear how you think the future looks for Michaela. You know, what what changes we can we can expect in terms of, of growth, uh, in terms of approach, opportunities. Uh, so without putting any particular time frame on it what do you think the future looks like for Michaela yeah um well uh we're opening a second school uh which looks like 2024 now in Stevenage um and then I'd hope to uh, do a third perhaps fourth school 
um, and really just keep going with what we're doing um, and expand and uh, give the opportunity uh, for other kids to be able to go to a Michaela school and also just show that it can be done in different environments um, with different head teachers. You know, sometimes people say, yeah, but Michaela only runs like this because you're running it, Catherine. So I want to prove that it's not just about me, that it's really about the systems and that um, you can transpose these systems anywhere and get a similar type of school. Amazing. It sounds like exciting stuff ahead and it'll be very, very yes. fascinating to see how it plays out and, 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 and what further growth and exciting opportunities are in the future of not just Michaela Community School, Michaela Community Schools, uh, plural, as, as we go forward. That is all we're going to have time for in our main conversation. However, whenever we have a guest on, we always like to finish by just getting a hot tip from the guest. Now, that can be a fun piece of advice or anecdote from your teaching experiences. It can be deadly serious, if you like, uh, but just a quick little hot tip for our teacher listeners out there. So what have you got for us today? Yeah, well, um, it's from my one of my deputies who, uh, the whole school, we use the verb to pop. Um, so rather than, because you're trying to get kids to do something and you don't necessarily want the situation to become confrontational, a word that you can use instead of do this or do that is to pop. So just pop your shirt in for me. Just pop your bag over there for me. Just pop over here for me. Um, and the verb to pop is less confrontational <laughs> than can you move over here? Can you put your bag over there? And so on. Just, just pop, just pop, you know, just pop your shirt in for me. Um, children are more likely to be compliant when you use that, that, that term is what we find. So we tend to use it a lot. So that, that's a bit of a fun Michaela fact for you. <laughs> there you go. Good. A good insider tip. Might start using that myself. Tell the listeners to pop a follow on the podcast or, uh, <laughs> or, or something like that. So thank you very much. Not just wisdom for listeners, wisdom for me too. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for coming on and for, for talking to us and for telling us your story and the story of Michaela. It's been an absolute pleasure. Okay. Thanks very much for having me. To all of our listeners, if you want to listen to any more episodes, you can find them on whatever platform you're listening to this on. You can find us on our main site at getatomy.com. For the time being, it's going to be goodbye from Catherine. Goodbye. And goodbye from me. Take care.